Hello, and welcome to part two of our pre-lab activities associated with the digestive system. In part one, which we just finished, we took a look at the digestive tract, essentially the tube-like organ running from the mouth to the anus. In part two, we're going to take a look at the digestive glands, so accessory structures that essentially dump materials into the digestive tract to assess, assist with the digestion and absorption of materials. So starting out within the oral cavity, we're going to have the salivary glands. Uh, the first of these we'll talk about is the parotid salivary gland. The parotid salivary gland is going to be exclusively serosecreting cells, and so this is going to be a protein-rich, watery secretion. And so these serous cells are going to have that characteristic, again, a basal basophilia. Uh, nuclei, kind of rounder, slightly euchromatic, uh, at the base of the cell, lots of uh, ribosomes within the middle portion of the cell, and then secretory vesicles, uh, which are going to carry uh, the protein-rich watery secretions, and essentially the saliva, uh, the enzymes are going to be secreted from this, at the apical portion of the cell. Uh, we may not be able to see the lumen as clearly, uh, but recognize that these are are going to be secretory structures, exocrine mode of secretion, all of the salivary glands. Uh, so they're going to be dumping into a secretory uh, region and it's going to be transported through a duct system and delivered into the oral cavity. The sublingual salivary gland, as opposed to the parotid, which is almost or is entirely serous, uh, the sublingual is going to be a mixed gland, so both mucus and serous secreting cells, but it's going to be mainly mucus. And so again, the characteristics we've seen are mucus secreting cells in other regions of the body. Large, paler cytoplasm, maybe slightly uh, acidophilic uh, cytoplasm. Nuclei, again, condensed down, often pressed down, maybe flattened um, towards the base of the cell. Uh, but these cells are going to be producing mucus, so a relatively thick glycosaminoglycan-rich secretion. Again, there's going to be a lumen at the center of each one of these secretory structures, but it may be able, unable to identify it in a lot of these histological specimens. But again, recognize that dumping materials is being transported by a duct system. We look at the submandibular salivary gland. It's again an example of a mixed serous and mucous gland, more serous cells than what we'd see in the sublingual salivary gland. So again, in this one, we can see good examples of these darker staining serous cells, these lighter staining mucous cells. Uh, what we can often see uh, within the submandibular salivary gland are structures called serous demilunes. Uh, this is at the tip of the tubular alveolar structure, so essentially at the, the base of the test tube where we'd have the secretory region. We're going to have mucus secreting cells, and then the serous cells are going to form this demilune, this kind of half moon like structure, uh, forming a cap at the very base of this test tube like uh, secretory region. We go down uh, now into the next organ, uh, digestive organ we're going to take a look at is going to be the pancreas. Uh, the pancreas, again, is going to have uh, some protein secreting cells, the, so it has an appearance kind of like the serosecreting cells, like the par parotid gland that we talked about before. These are the cells making the digestive enzymes. But we're also going to have clusters of lighter staining cells, these islets of longer hugs, which are endocrine cells, cells involved with secreting hormones that are going to be involved with regulating both the activity of the digestive system as well as regulating what the body cells are going to be doing with the glucose and materials and nutrients that are being transported within the body. If we take a look at this then, we've got two modes uh, that are going to be going on within the pancreas. We're going to have the exocrine mode of the pancreas, so essentially the digestive system components, uh, the digestive enzymes and things like that, are going to be going into a duct system. So again, it's going to be an exocrine mode of secretion, uh, dumping materials into a secretory region and then transporting them through a duct system where they're going to be dumped into the duodenum. Okay, so the pancreatic acinar cells are going to be the cells that are going to be involved with making the digestive enzymes. Uh, they're again going to be relatively pyramid shaped, uh, basal basophilia, rounded nuclei, slightly basophilic appearance to the cytoplasm. Lots and lots of uh, cytoplasmic granules are going to be referred to as zymogen granules uh, within uh, the pancreas. And these, again, are going to be where we're going to have that enzyme stored in an inactive state so that when materials are in the duodenum, when they're uh, materials to be digestive, uh, introendocrine cells within the small intestine are going to release cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin is going to be distributed throughout the body as a hormone but it's going to stimulate these pancreatic acinar cells to 
release their digestive enzymes so that they can assist with the digestion materials within the small intestine. The second type of cells within the exocrine pancreas, and I couldn't find a good example of this, uh, but these are going to be the central acinar cells. These are going to be one or two cells uh, towards the center of each acinus. So we've got the pancreatic acinar cells around here, kind of sketched in here or in this image. Uh, and then the central acinar cells are going to be paler cells in uh, contrast to the basal base affiliate cells and the pancreatic acinar cells secreting the digestive enzymes over here. These cells are going to be clearer, uh, kind of towards the center of each acinus, and they're going to be involved with secreting a watery bicarbonate-rich fluid. And that's going to be important because it's going to buffer the pH of those highly acidic materials coming out of the stomach. And so we need that to both protect the lining of the small intestine as well as neutralize that pH, buffer that pH, so that our digestive enzymes work better. Now the central acinar cells are going to be responding to secretin. Again, secretin is going to be a hormone released by those intraendocrine cells, those hormone secreting cells, in response to acid building up within the small intestine. So we talked about the exocrine mode of secretion within the pancreas. So essentially dumping the materials into a duct system and delivering it to the small intestine. We're also going to have an endocrine mode of secretion associated with the pancreas. So endocrine hormone secreting, so essentially releasing the hormones into the connective tissue around it where it's going to be picked up within a highly vascularized capillary bed and then transported throughout the body. And so in this image, uh, we've got the pancreatic acinar cells, the darker staining cells, darker staining acini kind of around it. And these lighter staining clusters of cells are going to be the islets of Langerhans. Now, if we take a look at this uh, in hematoxylin eosin or most stained uh, specimens, we're not going to be able to identify the different cell types found within the islets of Langerhans. But within them are at least four types of cells. We've got alpha cells secreting glucagon, beta cells secreting insulin, delta cells uh, secreting somatostatin, and PP cells uh, secreting pancreatic polypeptide. And you can review the book or review the lecture for what each of these different enzymes is going to be doing. But again, keep in mind, they're related to the digestive system functions, but they're going to be a hormone that's going to be circulated throughout the body, and they're going to regulate the activity of cells with what they're doing with glucose and other materials that are being brought into, uh, the, uh, into the body from the digestive system, primarily glucose. The final gland we're going to take a look at associated with the digestive system is going to be the liver. And the liver is going to be the largest gland of the body. Uh, it's got a dual blood supply, so it's going to have... Uh, blood coming in from the hepatic portal vein, essentially blood that's draining from the intestines, and so nutrient-rich blood, but oxygen-poor because we've already gone through a capillary bed within the intestines, but delivering those uh, nutrients, delivering those materials absorbed in the small intestines into the liver first. Uh, we're also going to have the hepatic artery, and this is a true artery bringing in oxygen-rich blood into uh, the liver and regions of the liver. Again, oxygen there to keep these cells alive because they're going to be fairly metabolically active. Now, uh, the liver is going to be involved with processing storage of the nutrients. Uh, because it's the first structure to see the materials that are coming from the small intestine and being absorbed in the body, it has the ability to essentially modify or detox, uh, uh, do detoxification uh, to break down potentially dangerous, dangerous chemicals. Uh, it's going to be involved with storage of things like glucose, fat, and vitamin A. Uh, and it's also going to be involved with synthesizing bile, a material that's going to be assisting in the breakdown of fat materials. Now, if we take a look at the image over on the right-hand side, we can see the liver tissues. Let's keep in mind, we're looking at a pig liver in this slide. And so we've got this connective tissue region between the classic liver lobules. When we take a look at human liver, uh, we're not going to have this connective tissue. We're going to see kind of a, uh, essentially a continuous network of these uh, liver cells, which are going to be called hepatocytes. Now, one of the identifying structures, both uh, anatomically and functionally associated with the liver, are going to be these portal canals. And the portal canals are going to be composed of three components, a portal triad, with a little bit of connective tissue around them and establishing kind of a, a boundary, a distinct region here. We take a look at this. We're going to have a branch of the hepatic artery. Uh, the hepatic artery carries about 25% of the liver's blood supply, so it's going to be a much smaller structure. Um, and in, in essence, it's going to be an arterial, uh, so a relatively small arterial within this region, bringing oxygen-rich blood into this area of the liver. 
we're going to have a branch of the hepatic portal vein, again, because we have an arterial over here from the hepatic artery. We're going to have a venule over here from the hepatic portal vein. Uh, it's much larger because it's going to be carrying about 75% of the blood supply, but it looks very similar to uh, veins and venules that we've seen in other regions of the body. So we've got uh, the blood supply coming into the region. We're also going to have the bile duct here, a simple cuboidal line uh, duct system, which is going to be carrying bile away from the hepatocytes out of the liver where it's going to be stored in the gallbladder and then delivered to uh, the duodenum, uh, essentially delivered into the small intestine to assist with the breakdown of, of fats and lipids. Now, if we go from the portal um, previous slide, uh, we look at the blood being delivered uh, from both the hepatic artery and the hepatic portal vein, and it's going to go into a capillary bed. And that capillary bed within the liver is going to be referred to as the liver sinusoids. And so what we're going to have essentially are going to be these liver blood capillaries, uh, essentially these uh, very thin capillary spaces that are going to be running between the hepatocytes, these plates of liver cells here. Now, the hepatocytes uh, are going to be normally one or two cell, or cell layer plate thick, two, one or two cell thick layered plates. Uh, they're going to be found so that in essence, each of these liver sinusoids is going to be in contact with a hepatocyte. Each hepatocyte is going to have at least one side of it against a liver sinusoid, sometimes two sides, but at least one side associated with it so that everything that's passing through these uh, hepatic sinusoids, through these liver capillaries, is going to be in very, very, very close proximity to these hepatocytes, so they can get access to these materials very rapidly. Again, to assist with the ability to get to this very rapidly, uh, we're going to look at these hepatocytes having a discontinuous endothelial wall. The space of DES is essentially that interstitial tissue space between the liver sinusoid and the hepatocytes, so materials are flowing very easily into the interstitial space, the tissue space, where they can be uh, processed or absorbed by these hepatocytes. So these liver sinusoids then drain into what would be central veins, again, relatively thin-walled structure, uh, receiving blood from these liver sinusoids, not a whole lot of connective tissue around it. So it's essentially, you see these liver uh, cells, these hepatocytes around the outside, maybe a very thin boundary kind of delineating this as a vein or a venule uh, when we take a look at it, but it's going to be characterized by the fact that it doesn't have the hepatic, a branch of the hepatic portal vein or the hepatic artery and the connective tissue around it, so it doesn't look like the portal canal uh, and the portal triad. And so the central vein, just lots of these hepatocytes around the outside. And that finishes up our overview of the glands associated with the digestive system. Uh, hopefully, by this point, you'll be able to go through the images and identify the, the, the structures uh, that we're looking at. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu.